Welcome back, everybody. This is Mr. Johnson with you once again. This is Lecture 19. We're in Section 6.3, page 328 of our textbook, Spectroscopy, the Interaction of Matter and Electromagnetic Radiation. I'd like you to take a moment to answer these two questions in the warm-up. What is a photon, and what is the electromagnetic spectrum? Take a moment to answer those two questions, and then pause the video, come on back, and I'll give you, a, hopefully, a good answer here in a moment. I thought I'd turn this one over to Mr. Anderson with Bozeman Science to explain to us what photons are and the nature of the electromagnetic spectrum. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics Essentials. Video 125, it's on photons, which are little packets that make up light. I got an email from somebody, and they said they have a touch light in their house, so you can touch it with your finger, and it goes through different cycles. But they could hit it with a UV light, and it would cycle through as well. And they wanted to know what was going on. Well, this is the photoelectric effect. And so what you're doing is you're kicking off electrons with that light. And it was really explained by Albert Einstein in 1905. Scientists knew that if you hit UV light on metal it would kick off these little sparks but he described why that occurred and it also unlocked this whole idea of light being a particle and so light is a photon or travels as photons and those photons can be both waves and particles and Einstein showed that the amount of energy in a photon is equal to H and H is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light so as you increase the frequency you're going to increase the amount of energy that that photon has he also showed that photons are quantized that means that they traveled in little discrete units so instead of being a long wavelength stretched out, they're discrete little particles. Evidence came from spectral lines, both of emission and absorption spectrum, and then the photoelectric effect, which we'll get into in just a second. And so remember, light is made up of electromagnetic radiation, and we're just looking at one small bit of it. So it goes from really small to long wavelengths, and inversely from really low frequency to high frequency. And so an example of a wave that would have really high energy, high frequency would be gamma rays, but it's going to have a low wavelength. And radio waves are going to have long wavelengths, but they're going to have really low frequency. And so our model up to the time of Einstein was that it was a transverse wave, that the waves are traveling in one direction, but there are electric fields and magnetic fields that act perpendicular to that. But we thought it was one continuous wave that was able to, for example, interfere. The first piece of evidence that it wasn't was spectral lines. And so if you take hydrogen, put it inside a discharge tube. So if you take hydrogen, put it in a discharge so if you take hydrogen, put it in a tube, and run electrons through it, it'll give off light. But that light isn't continuous. What you're going to get are these discrete lines, or these spectral emission lines. And also, if you run light through that hydrogen, it's going to absorb the comparable uh, wavelengths of light as well. And so that suggests that light exists in these discrete little units. Further research showed really what's going on. And so what's happening is as an electron moves to a higher energy level, it needs to absorb a photon to make that change. And as it falls back down, it emits a photon. And so those photons exist in discrete units. And depending on what the atoms are, you need different amounts of photons to move the energy levels higher or lower. So this is a model of the photoelectric effect. It's the PHET simulation. I would encourage you to try it. And so what you can do is you can measure the electron that are kicked off the metal in a simple little current and then you can change the intensity and you can change the wavelength remember if we increase the wavelength we're decreasing the frequency and what they found is when you tried infrared light nothing happened but as you decrease the wavelength therefore increase the frequency what would happen is you get to one point and then all of a sudden you get a flood of these electrons getting kicked off and it wasn't a gradual change it either kicked off the electrons and we generated current, or it didn't. And so what you can use is a graph of that. So what we're going to do is graph the frequency on the bottom, and then we're going to graph the amount of energy that's created. And so what we find is there's this nice linear relationship. And so as you're decreasing the frequency, you're decreasing the energy, and then there's no energy at all. And so then as we increase in the frequency again, what will happen is we'll follow that linear relationship. So this is using copper plates on either side of this vacuum tube, but we could change it to something else. We could change the metal, for example, to zinc, and now we're going to 
change the frequency and we see that same graph, that linear relationship between the frequency and the energy. What did that show Einstein? Well, that showed him that there was a direct relationship and so we could figure out how much energy is being released. And so all you do is simply take the frequency times Planck's constant and that tells you the energy of an individual photon because it's one photon that's kicking off one electron that's generating the amount of energy that we have. And so this is our formula. Energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency. As we increase the frequency, they're increasing the energy. And so did you learn to support this photon theory using the photoelectric effect? I hope so and I hope that was helpful. All right, hopefully that video was interesting and helpful. Um, Dr. Anderson talked about how photons are these packets or particles of energy, which is correct, but it is a little bit incomplete because photons are also a fundamental particle. There are only so many fundamental particles from which all of matter in the universe is comprised. There's quarks, there's leptons, and there's bosons, and this is not something that in this class we get much into. Notice that you see electron as a lepton. Notice there aren't protons and neutrons in this table because they're made of other fundamental particles. But then over here in the boson section is the photon. So it is also not just a packet of energy or the energy that can be absorbed or released by an electron as it rises and falls energy levels, but it's also a fundamental particle. And if we scroll down this page, we see the two equations that I revealed to you in lecture 17, I think it was. Uh, and that Mr. Anderson talked about as well, at least this top one, where the energy of a photon, the change in energy, the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds times the frequency. Again, substantiating that frequency and energy are directly related and it's linear. As the frequency of a photon increases or as the frequency of light increases, so does the energy. And then down below is the other equation we saw. Mr. Anderson didn't talk about this one relating the speed of light to wavelength and frequency. C is the speed of light. It's a constant, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And the speed of light, once again, is equal to the wavelength of light times the frequency. What that's substantiating mathematically is that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional, meaning as the wavelength of light increases, the frequency decreases, or as the wavelength decreases, the frequency increases. Uh, again, if the frequency increases, the energy increases, so could we say that if the wavelength decreases, the energy increases because frequency, excuse me, wavelength and in, uh, energy are inversely proportional. All right, we're going to skip to the next page. So here, like we saw in the video, we've got a nice image of the electromagnetic spectrum, the spectrum along which all photons of light that exist in the universe lie, or the spectrum along which all energies or frequencies or wavelengths of light exist. Those all are meaning the same thing. Um, at one end of the spectrum are gamma rays. Those are the shortest wavelength, highest frequency, highest energy waves, deeply penetrating uh, and fairly dangerous to human cells, human molecules. Bonds can be broken easily by gamma rays. Um, slightly lower in energy than gamma rays are x-rays. and We're going to talk about those later as part of this lecture. Um, lower in energy than x-rays is ultraviolet. And what ultraviolet literally means is higher than violet. Ultraviolet is the type of light that is slightly higher in energy than visible violet light. In the middle of the spectrum, we see visible light comprising, as you can see, a relatively narrow band of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. The color of visible light that has the most energy is violet, which again is why ultraviolet is that type of light with slightly more energy than violet. And as we move along the visible spectrum, we get to red light, which has the lowest energy or lowest frequency or longest wavelength. These values down here are the wavelengths in nanometers. That's how we often express wavelengths, as I mentioned before, nano being 10 to the minus 9. Infrared is lower energy than visible light, and it's lower than red light. It's why it lies to the right of visible or to the right of red light. Infrared literally means lesser than red. And then the lowest energy waves with very long wavelengths, up to a mile long, are radio waves. Um, and radio waves comprise radar, TV, FM, and AM being the lowest energy radio waves at all. I know we've done this before, but I thought we'd give you a chance to practice a little bit more using those two equations. So please complete this quick check, write it down in your book or somewhere else, come back and check your work against mine. Please do this quick check here on this page. For the first one, I got 2.5 times 10 to the 9, 1 over seconds, or inverse seconds, we could say, or hertz. Hertz is 1 over seconds. I took the wavelength in centimeters, converted it to meters, 
use the speed of light equation equaling wavelength times frequency, isolated frequency, divided the speed of light by the wavelength and found the frequency to be again 2.5 times 10 to the 9 inverse seconds. And I got 1.6 times 10 to the minus 24 joules for the second one. I used the E equals HV equation. Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds times the frequency found in the prior question gives us, again, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 24 joules. Great, but kind of random last question. Uh, what is the primary molecule being excited to higher energies in food being warmed? The answer is water. Microwaves, which we didn't see on the electromagnetic spectrum in our book, but do exist on there. Um, have a frequency that is similar to the frequency at which water molecules vibrate in a liquid phase. Water molecules are vibrating back and forth at a frequency similar to microwaves, such that when microwaves hit water molecules, the water molecules are able to absorb that light, those microwaves, and vibrate faster, raising their kinetic energy and raising their temperature. It's kind of like someone who's swinging, and you can only really make someone who's swinging swing higher if you push them at the same frequency that they're already swinging. And that's how microwaves work. And they only work to heat up foods with water in them because it is only the vibration of water that is increased through a microwave. So we flipped the page. We're now on 330 of our textbook. And I'm looking at this section at the top titled spectroscopy. Uh, this list are the four types of spectroscopy that our book addresses. Nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. Infrared spectroscopy, IR. UV and visible light spectroscopy, and then X-rays, or photon electron spectroscopy, or what is abbreviated PES. It is these latter two that we in this class need to focus on. The prior two are fascinating, and if you want, read about them in your book. It's really interesting. There's great medical applications, but again, it's only these latter two that we'll be focusing on in this lecture and in this class. This first of the two, UV and visible light spectroscopy, we've, we've talked a bit about uh, how atoms Electrons can absorb photons of certain energies, causing the electrons to rise to a higher energy state, to an excited state from which they can fall back down and emit light. We'll talk a little bit more about that, though, but we have addressed that first one. It's this latter one that the majority of the remainder of this lecture will be about. PES, or photon-electron spectroscopy. I've skipped all the way ahead to page 334 of our textbook looking at this section titled Ultraviolet and Visible Light Spectroscopy. This top paragraph is reminding us about things we've already heard today, how, um, a, sorry, to either side of visible light is UV and infrared, how infrared light is lesser in energy than visible light, infrared literally means lesser than red, and how ultraviolet light is higher in energy than visible light. It's reminding us as well that the visible light Spectrum lies between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. That's helpful to remember, but not crucial. And that if all colors of visible light are merged together, it is white light. Uh, why we see from the sun the light being white or from light bulbs is that it's actually a combination of all colors of light. Then the bottom of this page has in it, which you saw already, Coulomb's law, written as it is typically expressed, and then a reminder of what the effective nuclear charge is, how the effective nuclear charge is the number of protons minus the number of screening electrons or shielding electrons, the non-valence electrons. And remember that the ZEFF is ultimately, and not coincidentally, the number of valence electrons that an atom has and really helps us understand how periodic trends work. So I flipped the page. I'm now on 335 of the textbook looking at this little section highlighted in green about UV and visible light spectroscopy. Uh, again, we already know that this is the phenomena that accounts for electrons rising and falling, absorbing or emitting UV or visible light. What I may not have been clear with you about when we explained it earlier is that when it's UV and visible light that is absorbed or emitted by atoms, it is the valence electrons that are absorbing that energy and going to a higher energy state or are falling back down from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. It's the valence electrons, the ones in the outermost energy level. It just so happens that the amounts of energy that valence electrons can absorb or emit because they're already in fairly high energy states corresponds with the energies that are invisible and UV light. When valence electrons rise and fall between energy levels or sublevels, they are absorbing or emitting UV or visible light. And on occasion, infrared. If you remember hydrogen, when we saw its Bohr model emits infrared anytime an electron falls to the third energy level or higher. Yeah, that's it. All right. 
what this section in orange is telling us is that valence electrons, when they absorb light, UV or visible, or possibly infrared, um, can, we know, go to a higher energy level. But if they absorb an amount of energy that is greater than the difference between an electron in the ground state and in an excited state, it's possible that that electron may be given so much energy that it leaves the atom altogether, that the atom is ionized, that the atom has lost that electron. It'll ultimately be gained by another atom, but it's lost by that original atom. When that happens, that process happens, an atom becoming ionized due to the absorption of a higher amount of energy than would otherwise just raise that electron to a higher energy state, that's called photoionization. Again, when an atom is ionized or it loses its electron due to the absorption of a high energy photon, it's photoionization. And that phenomena is called the photoelectric effect, which uh, Dr. Anderson talked a bit about. This is a great quick check and a really important diagram, but we're going to skip it in this lecture because we will come back to this concept in far more detail when we do our next lab. All right, so we're moving on from, except we will come back to it in our lab, visible and UV spectroscopy to X-ray or photoelectron spectroscopy abbreviated PES. This is the, the brand new part of this lecture from which a skill that I'll teach you shortly will arise. All right, well, this first bit in green tells us that the non-valence electrons, the core electrons, the shielding electrons, are considerably more difficult to remove from the atom. They would take far more energy to remove than would valence electrons. The reason is not only are they closer to the nucleus, not only is the distance lesser, and that increases the force of attraction, but the effective nuclear charge is significantly greater because the further in one gets, the fewer shielding electrons are. So the effective nuclear charge goes up, the distance goes up. And remember, it's distance squared that affects the force. Excuse me, the distance decreases. Distance squared affects the force, um, therefore exponentially. And the attractive force is much stronger, much more energy it takes to remove core electrons, non-valence electrons. What that means is that UV invisible light is not energetic enough to remove those electrons. It takes X-rays, very high energy photons, to remove inner or core electrons. Again, the non-valence electrons are much more tightly bound to the nucleus, and to remove them takes a higher energy light, a higher energy photon, coming in the form of X-rays. So what we see here is a fairly basic schematic uh, of a PES machine or a PES process, and we're on, we're on page 337 of our textbook. The basic principle of a PES process is a focused beam of X-rays is, is shown onto a sample of usually just one type of atom, and the frequency of those x-rays is known because the machine can provide a very specific frequency of x-rays. The energy of those x-rays is great enough to strip off first the valence electrons and then the core electrons to the point where the atom no longer has any electrons. As those electrons are ejected from the sample, they are picked up by this electron energy analyzer, which is able to detect the energy, the kinetic energy in the electrons as they were ejected from the sample, from the x-rays. Well, if the energy of the x-rays is known through h times v and the remaining kinetic energy of the electrons after they are ejected is known from the electron detector, then the energy that it took to remove them can be calculated using this equation. The energy that it takes to remove these electrons, their ionization energies, is equal to the energy that was in the light, h times v, minus the remaining kinetic energy. And this is the same type of process that's used to find first ionization energies, which we talked a bit about in our periodic trends lecture. So these are examples of the graphs that are generated from the machine that we just looked at. Uh, these are the PESs for hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron, the first five elements of the periodic table. Hydrogen's electron configuration is 1s1, helium's is 1s2, lithium's 1s2, 2s1, beryllium 1s2, 2s2, and boron of course 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. What PESs are used for among other reasons, is to identify elements or to understand the differences between the electrons, excuse me, between the energies that electrons have in different elements. There's a lot of different things that can be determined from a PES. Um, why hydrogen's PES is the way that it is, is that it has only one electron in the 1s sublevel. The number of peaks in a PES corresponds to how many sublevels an atom has electrons in. Hydrogen has electrons in only one sublevel, so there's only one peak. Notice the units on the x-axis are in megajoules per mole. That's a very 
high amount of energy because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to remove these very close to the nucleus or core electrons. Helium also has electrons in only one sublevel, so we only see one peak. Again, the number of peaks corresponds to how many sublevels worth of electrons there are in an atom. But helium's peak is twice as great as hydrogen's because the height of the peak corresponds with the number of electrons that are being ejected from that sublevel. Helium's peak is twice as great as hydrogen's because two electrons are being ejected from the sub 1s sub 1s sublevel instead of just one. Notice as well that helium's peak is to the left of hydrogen's on the x-axis. What that's telling us is that it takes more energy to elect, eject both of hydrogen's 1s electrons than, excuse me, helium's 1s electrons than hydrogen's because the effective nuclear charge is greater. The number of protons is twice as great. Its peak is to the left, and that's something that you'd be asked to possibly explain later. If we go to lithium, which has electrons in two sublevels, we see two peaks. We see two peaks. How we read these is from left to right. The furthest left peak on a PES diagram is the electrons that are closest to the nucleus because those are the highest energy level. The energy is greater to the left, lesser to the right, and the electrons that are closest to the nucleus always take most energy to emit. So this would be the 1s2 peak for lithium. There's a second peak because there are two sublevels in lithium, a 1s sublevel and a 2s sublevel. It takes less energy to get rid of the 2s electrons in lithium than it did to get rid of the 1s electrons. Notice that that 2s peak is half as tall as the 1s peak because only one electron is being ejected from the 2s sublevel. As we go to beryllium, we'd expect two peaks as well because it, electrons are ejected from two sublevels. They are equal in height because two electrons are being ejected from both sublevels. And they lie to the left on the x-axis as do lithium's peaks because again, there's more protons in beryllium. It has a higher effective nuclear charge, holds onto those electrons more strongly, and it takes more energy to eject them. As we go to boron with electrons in three sublevels, as we'd expect, we see three peaks. The first two peaks are the same height as each other because two electrons are coming out of the 1s and 2s. And the third peak is half as tall as the first two because only one electron is coming out of the two peaks. The number of peaks in a PES corresponds to how many sublevels worth of electrons there are in an atom. The relative heights of the peaks, the heights of the peaks relative to each other, corresponds with how many electrons there are in the sublevel. And then where those peaks are on the x-axis represents how much energy it took. The further to the left on the x-axis these peaks are, the more energy it takes to eject those electrons due typically to lesser distances or to a higher effective nuclear charge. So one of the most common things to do if you're given a PES spectrum is to be asked to identify the element based on how many peaks there are and their relative heights. So here is a sample problem that I'll walk you through. Notice that there are three peaks. The left-hand peak is always going to be the 1s sublevel peak. So that very first peak is going to be 1s. And because there is a second peak, we know the 1s is full. So it's going to be 1s2. The second peak will always be the 2s peak. It's the same height as the 1s peak, so we know it's full. And if there's a third peak and there's a third sublevel to fill, we know that the 2s is also full. So 1s2, 2s2. The first peak is the 1s2 peak. The second peak again is the 2s2 peak. That third peak will always be the 2p peak. Notice it's fairly close to the 2s peak because the 2p is only slightly higher in energy than the 2s. Big difference between 1s and 2s. Smaller difference between 2s and 2p. Now here's where we got to pay really close attention to the relative heights. These peaks represent two electrons being ejected. They represent four lines on the y-axis. This peak is six lines. It's one and a half times higher than this peak. What that means is that this is two electrons being ejected. This is three because two times one and a half is three. So this third peak is the 2p. And because of its height relative to the other two, we know it's 2p3. So we go to the periodic table and figure out what the 2p3 element is, and it is, of course, nitrogen. So this PES represents nitrogen. I flipped my page. I'm now on 240, excuse me, 340 of the textbook, looking at the practice problem here. Um, give a go at 1a, 1b, 1c. Try to identify each of these elements based on what you were just taught. Come back and see how you did.
All right, I got magnesium for the first one, phosphorus for the second one, and sulfur for the third one. Just to talk you through my rationale, I know that first peak is always the 1s peak, and if there is a second peak, the first one will always be 1s2. So we got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Notice that peak is three times the height of the 2s peak, which makes sense. And then this last peak is the 3s, and being equal in height to the 1s and 2s peaks, we know it's 3s2. Second one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and then this last peak is going to be the 3p peak, and it's one and a half times higher than the 3s peak, or it's three bars compared to two bars. Each bar is an electron, 3p3, last term, phosphorus. This last one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, final peak is going to be 3p. It's twice the height of the 3s peak, or it's four lines worth, and it's looking like one line's an electron here, so that's going to be sulfur. Like we've mentioned already, instead of identifying the element, you could be asked to analyze why one set of peaks for one element is in a different placement on the, on the x-axis than another. Phosphorus, for example, has all of its peaks to the left of magnesium. It doesn't look like that, but notice that where the numbers are placed on the x-axis is different. So the 1s peak for phosphorus is a higher energy peak than the 1s peak for magnesium. Again, that's because phosphorus has more protons, it has a higher effective nuclear charge, and will hold onto those electrons more strongly. All of phosphorus's peaks are shifted to the left relative to magnesiums. Now I'll give a go at this second practice problem, this same page, and come back after you've tried it and compare your answer to mine. This looks sort of nice until I drill all these funky arrows. Anyways, uh, potassium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. So we expect to see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 peaks. The 1s peak and the 2s peak should be the same height. That one should have gone to the second line. I didn't quite get it there. The 2p peak should be three times the height of the 1s and 2s peaks. And by the way, like it said, because you don't know what the exact binding energies are, where these peaks are exactly on the x-axis doesn't matter. Um, 3s peak is the same height as the 1s and 2s peak. 3p peak, also the same height as the 2p peak. And then this last peak, the 4s, has to be half has half as high as the 1s, 2s, and 3s were. So there is potassium's PES diagram, beautifully drawn in red. And that is a wrap, folks. Uh, lecture 19 on spectroscopy, visible UV spectroscopy, and PES has come to a close. And I leave you with Manfred Mann's Earth Band Blinded by the Light. Have a great day, everybody.